Hello guys, welcome to another video on algorithms and data structures. Today I will talk about amortized analysis of algorithms. In this video, I'm trying to answer exactly why inserting inside a hash map, for example, has a runtime of O of 1. Or inserting at the end of an array or a vector has a runtime of O of 1. In order to answer questions like this, let's start with a simple example. Imagine I have a data structure, an imaginary data structure, we call data structures X, which only supports one operation, insert or push a value inside the data structure. And all we know is that the runtime of one push is sometimes O of 1 and sometimes O of n over 2. We don't know exactly when it's O of 1 and when it's O of n over 2. And then n is the total number of items inside the data structure. So if I give you this and I ask you what is the runtime of n pushes, you can say, okay, I can write n pushes is n times multiply by and be pessimistic and say I use the worst case scenario which is n over 2 therefore the t of n pushes is equal to n multiplied by n over 2 which is o of n2. We can say based on this runtime of one push is o of n2 over n which is o of n. Now I can say o of n2 is an upper bound for t of n pushes. But then the question is, is this a tight enough upper bound? As I talked before about this, not every upper bound is useful. Only tight upper bounds are useful or they are more useful. All right, so now for this imaginary data structure, suppose in an imaginary run, imaginary program, I, I was able to count exactly how many times the runtime of a one push was O of 1 and exactly how many times runtime was N over 2. And imagine, suppose, three times of, we did this N times, three times it turned out to be N over 2 and then the rest was only O of 1. Therefore, T of N pushes is 3 times n over 2 plus n minus 3 for these ones here, which is O of n. And compare this to what we calculated pessimistically before, which is O of n2. This is a significant difference. We went from O of n2 to O of 1. Based on this, I can write here 1 push is equal to O of n divided by n, which is really O of 1. And compare this again to what we calculated before, which is O of n. And now you can say t of 1 push is O of, a, o of 1, which is a constant value. And to be exact, amortized time of 1 push is O of 1. This is amortized, this is called amortized or average runtime. Because we still know that sometimes it was 1, sometimes it was n over 2, but during n pushes, on average, it took only a constant time. So in summary, in amortized analysis, if t of one operation is between two numbers, and we don't know exactly when is what number, but we just know that it's bit bounded between two numbers, we can calculate the runtime of n operations. And then we say the amortized runtime of one operation or the average runtime of one operation is t of n operations over n. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the basis of amortized analysis. Let's see this in a real example called pushing in a vector on an array using an algorithm called vector doubling. All right, so we have seen this in C++ or JavaScript or other languages like Python that we've kind of took it for granted that when you insert inside an array in a loop, you say the runtime of this line is O of 1. And then the, the whole loop is O of n based on this. But the reality is this is not exactly runtime 1. This is amortized runtime is O of 1. The average time is O of 1. And next, I'm going to tell you exactly how this is implemented. All right, so let's say I want to inside, insert inside a vector and I use a simple method that every time 
I, I insert and I don't have enough room, I create a new array and I insert the new value at the end of the array. So the first time my array was empty, I pushed the first item, which was i, which was one, and uh, the cost was just one. Now, when the second one comes, I have to create a new array of size two, copy one, and then insert two at the end. For the third one, I create yet a new array. I copy one and two, and then I, cop and I uh, copy three at the end. And I can keep this over and over. And based on this, t of push i at each stage is i minus one copy. So each time we have to copy i minus one times and then plus one push at the end. So the whole thing is of one. So you see like we kind of took it for granted to for a, for a push to be of O of one. But if you use a simple method, it's really O of i, it's not O of one. So let's see how we can use a more advanced method called array doubling. So imagine again, my array is one of size one and it's empty. And for the first time I push one value, uh, which is number one. And then because the array just had only one empty space, I double the size and then I push value of one. Again, now when I want to push value two, because I only have one empty space, I double the size first and then I push two in the array. For the third value, because I have empty space, I just copy it here without any copying. Now for the fourth item, because I only have one extra room here, I double the size of the array and I copy one, two, and three, and then the fourth item goes here. And I can keep doing this. For the fifth element, I don't need copying. For the sixth element, I don't need copying and so forth. So basically, T of one push or push I is sometimes one and sometimes I. For these cases that I had to double the array, the, the cost was I. And that was the case that only one of them was empty, one, one, um, the one element was empty. And then for the cases that I have more empty spaces, the cost is only one. So we are going back to one operation is between two values. Here in this case, it's between i and one. And we wanna find out how many times it was i, how many times it was one. So if you look at the sequence of pushes, the first time I had to double, for pushing two, I had to double. For three, I didn't have to double because I had room. For four, I had to double. For five, six, seven, I didn't have to double. For eight, I had to double. And then so we can continue doing this pattern. And you can see I only double for one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, basically powers of two. So if I wanna write T of 32 pushes, it's equal to T of push one, T of push two, and up to T of push 32, which is equal to one, T of push one plus two plus four plus eight plus 16, which is one plus two plus four plus eight plus 16 plus 32, plus the number of times that the runtime was one. So it's 32 minus six times multiplied by one. So this, first term would add up to 64 minus one. And then the second term would add up to 32 minus log of 32, which is six. And basically if you uh, simplify this, it adds up all to three N minus log of N, which is basically T of N pushes is O of three N equal to O of N. Now that I have T of N push equal to O of N, I can say, compared to previous times that I found it to be O of N2, I have significant difference. And basically, if T of N push is equal to O of N, then you can say on average, T of one push is equal to T of N push divided by N, which equals to O of one. And compare this to what we found earlier, which is O of N. This is significant difference. This is a much 
tighter upper bound, which is now useful, is constant. Now we kind of proved that y that O of n holds, y pushing inside an array has actually a constant time O of 1. So you can say runtime of each push is O of 1, but please be that person that corrects everyone, that annoying person that says it's not true that runtime of each push is 1, amortized runtime of each push is O of 1. Because in reality, sometimes it's I, sometimes it's 1. On average or amortized, it's O of 1. Now, there's another method for this calculation, which is called accounting or banker method. We are still doing the same problem of pushing inside an array using another way of counting. So in banker's method, you basically say, if I have to do multiple actions, I can do it this way. So suppose you want to go to the post office and buy stamp and buy envelopes. And let's say you go in separate trips. First time you go to buy a stamp and you pay $1. A week later or a day later or a month later, you go back again, you buy an envelope for another $1. Now in amortized or banker method, instead of uh, going, uh, spending money twice, you go the first time, but you spend $2 rather than $1. You spend $1 on stamp and $1 you, you, you save it in your bank account. So that means the second time when you go to buy envelope, you don't have to spend any money out of your pocket. You simply use the money that you had in the bank and you pay for the envelope. So the total cost still the same, but we count the total count in different times now. So instead of counting one and then counting one, we counted two and then count zero. And this basically allows us to simplify our calculation. That's kind of like a magic trick that you do to simplify your calculations. Let's see how this applies to array doubling. So going back, my push was sometimes i, sometimes 1. t of n push was o of 3n or o of n. Now I can say, I can have this idea, what if from the beginning we consider each push costs 3 units? If you have extra cost, so instead of cost uh, paying one, we pay three, and then we store extra cost in the bank to be used later on. And I tell you how we use it later on. But there's another condition that we have to be careful so that your bank account doesn't become negative. So we never want to go back to negative amount. And here is a more accurate description of our idea, which is each push has cost of three. Remember, we calculated to be cost of one, but instead of one, we have cost of three. And the idea is to spend one for push and two goes in the bank, which later on will be used for copying. So first time I insert one, the cost was three. I spend one to push, and then two goes in the bank. This two number here goes to the bank and my total bank money is two. Next, I spend one of the money in the bank to copy one in a new array and I push number two again. I spend the cost of three. I spend one of them for pushing. Two goes in the bank. So two, I write it here. Next, I write value three. I double the size of the array. I copy one and two using the money that I have in the bank. So I had three. I spent two of them to copy one and two. So two becomes zero because I spent them to copy. And then I insert three again, one for push, one for two that goes on top of two. Up next, pushing the value of four. In this case, I didn't have to copy anything. So I just copy four here. And then the cost of pushing four is three. I spend one for push, two goes in the bank, which sits on top of four. For inserting value five, I have to double the array. I spend the money I stored in the bank. I have five. I spend four of it for copying one to four here. 
And then for five, I spend one for push, two goes in the bank. And I keep doing this for six and for seven and for eight. And then again, for nine, I have to double and I use this money that I had in the bank to move or copy eight numbers in the new array. And then for nine, one for push, two goes in the bank. So because we were able to keep our balance positive, we see that each assigning a cost of each push to be three kind of works because I was able to push with one and I was able to use the money that was in the bank to be spent on copying. Therefore, the runtime of each push is really of three or of one. And again, please be that person that corrects everyone and says, no, amortized runtime of each push is of one. And as a summary, you need to cost, count extra in the beginning and then save and use the extra credit later. That's the banker's method. And be careful so that your balance never becomes negative. All right, let's look at another example, which is called hash table doubling. Basically, we want to answer the question why inserting inside a hash table has a constant runtime. So hash tables are used in languages like C++, Java, and um, we know we are kind of taking it for granted that insertion, search, or removal have a constant time complexity. But the question is why? What is the data structure that does this? So I quickly go over the data structure. The, the complete description is out of the scope of this video, but I explain how this is happening in general. So for inserting inside a hash table, you have a table and you have a hash function. The hash function, all it does, it converts a key to an index inside your table. So for example, the key Alice becomes index two, and then I can find information about Alice. Now for Ari, again, maybe the hash function maps it to two. So now I have two items here. If I have two items, I can put them inside the list. It can be a linked list. And basically after finding the index, I kind of have to look inside the linked list and find if it was Alice or Ari. So basically a hash table is a table followed by multiple linked lists. Now, if I have n items, total of n items in my hash table, and my table size is h, the total number of uh, uh, items in each, in each linked list is on average n over h. And if I'm able to keep this average number n over h, a small number or a constant number, then I can say with a good hash function, the push runtime is O of one for going from hash function to the index, plus n over h, which would be the search on average, the, the length of this is on over h, so it would be at worst n over h searches to find the value, for example, Alice or Ari. And if n over h is small, then the search time is really O of 1. So that's the idea behind how the data structure works to support O of 1 for inserting or searching inside a hash table. And the idea is that as n grows, so this, as n grows, this, uh, the length of this um, uh, linked list also grow. So the idea is that as it grows, we also increase h so that uh, the, this, this size, the, the maximum length of this also becomes smaller. So in general, we can keep it under a constant value. So it's always, this approximation is always O of one. What exactly am I saying? So imagine I had these many and I keep inserting inside my hash table. Once I get to 16, instead of keep inserting, I double the size of my hash table. I divide all the values inside my hash table to this new one. So I basically recreate the entire hash table. And now my linked list have smaller size. And then I insert my 16th item. So again, the idea was 
at some point we insert with O of 1 and then at some other point we have to recreate the entire hash table again so that we can keep these sizes, this maximum length to be small value. And the idea is whenever n becomes 1 or 2 or 4 or 8, basically powers of 2, we double the size and modify the hash function. So we go back to what we had for inserting inside the array. Remember the previous algorithm, which was t of push of i is sometimes i and sometimes y. This is very similar to array doubling. So if I have this, just like array doubling, sometimes i, sometimes y, what is t of n pushes? And again, you guessed it, welcome to amortized analysis. So this is very similar to array doubling, so I'm going to explain it very quickly. Sometimes i, sometimes 1. This is pushing inside a hash table. So for the power of 2, we have to recreate the entire hash table, and it takes O of i. But other times, we just simply insert, and that takes O of 1. So the calculations is kind of like the same, and t of n pushes is O of n. And if t of n push is O of n, on average, t of 1 push is equal to t of n push over n, which is O of 1. And runtime of each push is O of 1. And please be that person again. Okay, guys, just say amortize runtime of each push is O of 1. So as a homework assignment, I would like you guys to go back and redo the hash table doubling using the bankers method. It's very similar to array doubling, so I don't repeat it here, but it's a very good homework for you guys to redo this and see if you can make the equations work. All right, I want to talk about one more example. All right, let's talk about another example, binary counter. So. Here's the problem. Given a string of size n of all zeros, implement a binary counter. So remember, these are strings. These are not integers. So my integer first is all zeros. Then it has to be 1. Then it becomes 1, 0, then 1, 1, and so forth. So the algorithm, if you notice, is that start from right to left, flip the first consecutive ones until you see a zero. So for example, here I don't see any consecutive one, so I just flip zero to one. From zero, one to one to zero, one zero. From here to here, I, do, I only see one one. So based on this, I flip it to zero and then flip the zero after that. So zero becomes one. Now from this to this, there's no consecutive one, so I just flip zero to one. From here to here, there are two consecutive ones. I Based on this, I flip them to zero and then flip zero to one and so forth. This is the algorithm. Here's an implementation in C++. You can write in your favorite language, JavaScript or Python. Basically, you have a string and you have a for loop and then you basically find the consecutive ones and you try to flip them and then you flip the last zero. Now, here, the outside loop, every pass, you, you have n passes, and inside every pass, you have this while loop, which counts the consecutive ones. So the, uh, the, this outer loop, we know that it happens, it repeats n times, but what about this inside loop? We don't exactly know how many times it's executed. And the question is, what is the runtime of each pass? Basically, in pass i, we flip at most log two of i bits. So if I'm counting, for example, and I have these many bits uh, equal, uh, representing number i, uh, that would be the number of these bits would be log two of i. And based on this, I can say tr pass i, I flip either one bit or two bits, or at most log of log two of i bits. So again, t of each operation is between two numbers. We don't know exactly what. But being pessimistic or conservative, you can say count of n and use 
pessimistic or worst case and say it's log of one for pass one, log of two for pass two and so forth. So therefore t of count to n pessimistically has O of n log of n. This is a uh, upper bound, but then the question is, is it a tight one or is it useful? In order to answer that, let's see if we can count exactly how many times the each pass is one or log of two of i or somewhere in the middle. Let's see if we can find exactly what value is. And again, welcome to amortized analysis. So if you look at um, the sequence of counts and the bits, you look at the first bit, it always flips. So if I count to n, I have n flips for bit zero. For bit one, it flips half of the times that bit zero flips. So that would be n over two. For the next bit, that would be n over four. And we can continue writing this. So t of count to n is equal to n plus n over two plus n over four. And in the limit, this value, this total is two, two multiplied by n, which is O of 2n. So if I have n operations to be O of 2n, each pass then would be t of count to n divided by n, which is O of 2. And compare this what we, to what we calculated before, which was log of i. This is a constant value now. Therefore, again, amortized runtime of each pass is O of 2. All right. So basically, counting each pass was only constant time. Now, we can calculate the same thing using a counting or banker method. So observe the sequence of counts. First, we have this value, all zeros. Then we have one. Then we have one zero. Then we have one one. So if you notice, each time we have at most one flip from zero to one. So here there was one flip to, from zero to one. Here this bit flips, here this bit flips, and then from here to here, these two bits flip to zero, but flip from zero to one only happens once. Same thing here, flip from zero to one only happens once. So this is an observation that we make. Each time they have at most one flip from zero to one. So the idea then is, what if we count flip to one, we assign cost of two, one for flipping and one in the bank. And for flip to zero, we assign a cost of one, but we use the bank money to flip to zero. Therefore, the first time we have all zeros, then we go from zero to one, we uh, spend two, one for uh, flipping, one goes in the bank, sits on top of one. And then we go again from zero to one. We spend two, one goes in the bank, one goes here. And then we spend this one from flip one to zero. Now we have one flip of zero to one. The cost was two. We spend one for flipping, one sits here. This one didn't change, so the, this, this one will stays here. And then from 0, 1, 1 to this number, we have one flip of 0 to 1, the cost is 2, so we spend 1 on flipping and 1 sits here, and then these two values in the bank will be spent to flip these two values. And then from here to here, 0 goes to 1, we spend 2, 1 is spent to flip, 1 stays here, and then this value doesn't change, therefore 1 goes here. So you can keep doing this and you see what you observe is that your bank account never goes to zero. Because you were able to do this, t of each pass is O of 2 and basically you can say amortize runtime of each pass is O of 2. And that's the amortize analysis of a binary counter. So in summary, we talked about amortization. 
And this says when the cost of one operation is variable, calculate the cost of n operations instead. And then you can say t of one operation is equal to t of n operations divided by n. And this is basically called aggregate method. Now, we also talked about banker method, which was spend more in the beginning, keep your extra money or cost that you spent in the beginning in a bank account and use that bank credit in the future. Make sure your bank account is always non-negative. If you are able to do this, the money that you spend in the beginning is actually the amortized cost of that operation and you were able to use the banker method to find the runtime. There's also another method which is called potential energy or potential method, which is very similar to banker method. I don't talk about this here because they're very similar. In my opinion, it's kind of confusing. But if you guys watch this video and you felt like you want to have another video on this, I would be happy to provide another video. Please let me know in the comments. Thank you very much for watching this video and I hope to see you guys in the next ones. If you have any questions, please leave me a comment, give me a like and I see you guys next time.